I'm Jose Lopez. I'm a PhD student in the System Dynamics Group. My work is in operations management. And the uh, paper that I'm presenting today is titled The Hidden Cost of Hidden Fees. It's about price obfuscation in online platforms. And so let me motivate this by also doing a shameless plug for my new school. <laughs> Say you want to go to an event, a football game, and so tickets are already sold out. You pull up your favorite ticket reseller up and you search and you have an idea of what you want to pay. Say your stated willingness to pay is about 100 bucks and then you just scroll through and find something that looks attractive and uh, you decide that you're going to purchase. So you click through and you see still $100 and then you spend a little bit more time and click through again. You see there's a delivery option. It says mobile entry free. Okay, they don't have to print out the ticket. Good. They ask you for credit card information. You click again. And then all of a sudden, you're hit with 22.2 extra dollars that were not disclosed up front, right? So what happens here is there's some hidden service and some other order and processing fees that get tacked on at the very end, right? Okay, uh, so I'm sure you've all been in this situation before. And uh, what happens is then you get a push saying, these are selling out, you should be fast about this. So this falls into the category of deceptive features in online platforms. And we can think of examples from other industries. I just showed you ticket resellers, but uh, maybe you've ordered food on DoorDash or Grubhub and you see that not only are the menu prices higher than if you went to the restaurant, and those are disclosed, but there's also, uh, uh, small, or, small order fee, uh, direct to you fee. Uh, okay, uh, you can think of hospitality and uh, there's resort fees and cleaning fees that are only disclosed after you've already booked or after you're already staying there, right? Uh, you can think of airlines as the pioneers in this case. You get charged to pick a seat, to get some water, to buy some peanuts, to watch uh, entertainment on the Wi-Fi. And uh, some of these are uh, also uh, before taxes. So taxes get uh, tacked on in the end. So uh, we can say that these are ubiquitous. And you might be thinking, what's common across these? Uh, I would argue okay. that they are dominated by platforms. And these platforms, so investment in platforms is exploding. And, and, and um, most of our engagement with these kinds of companies goes through uh, third-party platforms. Uh, they are intermediaries that were supposed to help reduce search costs and make these matchings more efficient, right? They were gonna consolidate information and give it to you in a summarized way. But uh, there's some recent exploratory evidence to show that actually platforms benefit from the shrouding to uh, make thicker markets and that online marketplaces have let led to less transparent markets. Uh, this has been exploratory, so I wanna like drill down on this. Um, so my research questions are, basically, how does a platform's current strategy, strategy and its market position influence this decision to either continue to shroud or maybe buck pressure and become transparent? What does this mean for consumers? And what does this mean for the firm for profits? Uh, let's do a little bit of background because the literature on price obfuscation is fragmented. Uh, uh, you can call it price shrouding or obfuscation or drip pricing. But it's basically the idea that industries strategically exploit our cognitive limitations, how much information we can hold at one time when we make this decision, to um, make it difficult or time consuming to make these comparisons. And uh, we'll call price shrouding. Uh, or obfuscation, the tactics that are done with the intention of con preventing consumers to uh, become fully informed of the market prices. You could call it price dripping, hidden pricing, surcharges. Uh, dripping is the uh, example that I showed originally. And let's just contract this with transparency. And I'll use some of these terms uh, maybe interchangeably as we go forward. So this idea is not new for industries. What, what, what's the background here? Well, there's work from econ and marketing that shows that shrouding can be profitable. It's actually sometimes uh, increasing consumer willingness to spend. It's rational even in competition, even in repeated settings. 
Um, and the, the mechanism here is that consumers can be naive. And if there's a big enough population of naive consumers, firms can exploit that. Um, and also that there's kind of a sunk cost or search friction uh, effect here where you've already clicked through and you don't think you might get a better deal elsewhere. So you're kind of stuck and you'll pay above your original willingness to pay. But there's also more recent work in behavioral operations management saying that transparency can be profitable. And uh, we know that um, it can lead to higher profits for the firms and that the firms that engage in these kinds of tactics suffer through reputation effects and they don't build consumer loyalty and there's no trust. So, um, and the way the mechanism works here is that if you're willing to disclose something that's sensitive, that might not look initially attractive, the market, given enough time, might uh, reward you for that. Uh, but there's not a lot of work in the platform space. So um, this is where I find it really interesting. Uh, because of the way that this is set up in the short time, I wanna go ahead and give you a preview of the results right away and then show you our model and a little bit more. Okay, so the idea is that if you focus on the cross-site network effect, so uh, having more consumers brings more complementers to the platform, then there's an incentive for price shrouding. But if you understand other sources of value creation on the platform, then those incentives might flip. If you consider competition on the complementer side, so ticket sellers, that can increase pressure for shrouding. But if you consider competition on the platform side, that can flip. Uh, and then consumer behavioral learning, if, if you have sophisticated consumers, that increases pressure for transparency, but this takes time. So I talked about the cross-site, and this is how we typically think about platforms. Uh, just having more consumers brings more complementers, and that brings more consumers, and this drives an engine of adoption in the platform. We can actually build a more sophisticated model. I'm going to go quickly through the model and say that this is the cross-site network effect. But platforms can also make a choice to reinvest some of the revenue in feature development that is independent of what's happening on the other side of the market. And so we call this standalone value of the platform. And this can be a decision to be transparent, to make the rankings clear, to show the fees up front. And there's also the possibility that the users on the same side of the market interact with you and, and change your uh, attractiveness on the platform, either by giving reviews or by competing. So we should consider all of these sources of value creation, and this is what we call the value creation lens, uh, and it's MEC, so uh, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive way of looking at platform value creation. And, and now I'm gonna jump ahead and give a stylized description of the model. We can consider a monopoly setting or platform competition. We're gonna consider complementers, which I'm gonna call the supply side, and consumers, which are the demand side. We're gonna have the option of a platform uh, have hidden fees or unshroud them. So the final price is gonna be a, a combination of what's visible in the beginning and a hidden fee. Platform value creation is gonna be given by the value creation lens that we just saw. And platform profits are gonna be a function of final price times matchings minus costs. How do we do the matching? Okay, we have a utility function for the uh, complementers and a utility function for the consumers, and they're so clear that I won't spend time on them. No, actually, <laughs> they're, they're really simple, actually. What we have, the omegas are weights, but we, what we have is uh, complementary utility increases in market size, increases in final price, and decreases with an attractive outside option. And then consumer utility increases in market size, increases in perceived value, so you anchor on the initial price that you see, but there is a hidden penalty or a hidden fee that uh, gives you disutility, and this is new to our model, hasn't been considered before, and there's an outside option. Then we split the market via logit, and we just say that this gives you like indicated market shares, and it takes some time to get there. And this is the idea that prices and price perceptions are kind of sticky, it takes some time for consumers to become informed. So what happens if hidden fees, all first there were no hidden fees, then they drop, uh, they go up, and then some platform decides to drop it, perceptions, just update with some delay because we're talking about average markets, right? And so we're robust to different kinds of formulations for the perceptions, but here's a key finding. What happens to a platform that wants to sell for $130, that's the green line, that's final price, and is currently using a final price and a hidden fee, and they decide to become transparent. They drop the hidden fee. First thing they have to do is they have to increase the upfront quoted price. 
And so what happens to their prices? Look at the red line that's going to show up here. That means that at the moment that you become transparent, people have now been trained on the fact that there's going to be hidden fees on this platform, and you look very expensive. And this drives a lot of the behavior that we see in the model. So I'm just going to run through some intuition building cases here. What happens if we have a monopolist that always hides fees and there's no consumer learning? Well, you corner the market. Uh, con consumers go to this platform, it's the only option, and then complementers are driven by consumer adoption. And we're going to say, this is our baseline normalized revenue against what we're going to compare everything to. Uh, this is what's in the lit. This is why it's rational to do it if there's no app side option. What happens if there's consumer learning? Well, if there's consumer learning, after a while, consumers start becoming uh, disenfranchised or they're unhappy with the hidden fees, and they look for an outside option. So uh, let's say you get to 50% of the market share here, and some of the complementers find that it's not attractive to be there anymore. Now uh, revenues have dropped. What happens when you are still in a monopoly setting, but there's uh, the platform is realizing that they want to drop the hidden fees? First thing that happens is that uh, there's a sharper drop because consumers are still sticky on their price perception and only afterwards do they become informed and come to the platform. But what's really interesting here is that the green line can overtake the red. It's possible that the optimal solution was to become transparent, but you might not weather this. In competition, we find something similar. Competing platform, now P2, this, oh, P1, the blue line decides to become transparent, but uh, reinforcing loops, so here you, are sticky on high prices, and here reinforcing loops drive you out of the market. But so this is pretty discouraging. Uh, this is the case that I just showed, and we can think uh, this is when the weight on the penalty for shrouding is low. What happens if the weight on the penalty for shrouding is high? Maybe this helps me, right? Uh, it's worse, actually. <laughs> when have, you might get to convince everybody that you're uh, the better option because you're transparent, but no uh, firm has the deep pockets to weather uh, this dip, right? The competitors are just going to drive you out of the market. Fortunately, there is a Goldilocks zone. So there is the possibility that the, depending on the characteristics of your uh, market setting, that you would see a worse before better dynamic, but that it's something that the firm can can withstand. So I think I'm almost out of time. I'm going to say that the contributions uh, that this paper has made is that we introduce sophisticated consumers, we include platform competition, we uh, consider the disutility from shrouding, and it gives us an idea of the role of trust in these platforms. Um, so I'm going to stop here and take a question. Basically, I'd already previewed the results and just uh, say that here's my information. And, and yeah. yeah, I'm gonna make it uh, more salient, yeah. <laughs>